Mark. Thank you. That's good? Yeah. Tell me where you grew up and your fondest memories of your childhood. I grew up in New Jersey, in northern New Jersey, uh, in a little town called Chatham. And I guess the, the really memorable moments have to do with food. And, uh, you know, when I'm asked about my childhood and how I ended up in the restaurant business, it, it, it kind of goes back to my parents' victory garden that they always had from, from when I was born all the way through my childhood. They had a little patch of vegetable garden in the backyard. Uh, even though their lives changed, they still held on to that victory garden. And we ate tomatoes and corn and peppers from the garden. And my mother canned the applesauce and the rhubarb. And from my point of view, uh, those are probably the tastiest memories because my mother wasn't a very good cook. Did you help? Did you, were you there, sort of hands and knees, digging and planting? I remember eating in the garden. I, I, as a little child, uh, I, I think I was put out in the strawberry patch, and so I have kind of fond memories of warm strawberries and and something, something about being in the apple tree. And uh, I, uh, I was dressed one time, and I talked about it in my book. Uh, I was dressed as the queen of the garden, and I won a prize for that at a local costume contest and so it really stuck with me the whole outfit the asparagus skirt and the peppers around my wrists and the lettuce leaf for the top and uh, I, I, I can picture myself in that time I remember really vividly the applesauce cooking uh, the rhubarb uh, I remember the flowers in the garden my mother was always sort of pointing them out to me and helping me name them, uh, remember the names, uh, really helping me remember the names of them. And so roses and forsythia and iris and, and many uh, flowers as well as vegetables. I, I really know the, the aromas, know the kind of taste. I read in one interview that you said you were a very picky eater back then. I was a picky eater back then because my mother really was overwhelmed by, by the idea of cooking for a family of six. And she, um, she just did what was easiest and what she thought would be good for us. And we had brown bread and we had frozen vegetables. And... My friends weren't eating that, and I wished that I had something else. But she really cared whether we came to the table. I think that was the most important time for her, and she waited until my father got home from work, and we'd all sit down at the table together and eat. Uh, and I was pushed to eat more than I wanted. This period we're talking about is before college, the late 50s, coming into the 60s, isn't it? Well, actually, it's the late 40s yeah. coming into the 50s that I'm talking about. And, and a time when there was a lot, of, a lot of land between each little town in New Jersey. And it was called the Garden State for a reason. Uh, everyone had a garden during the war, and they kept that up afterwards. Was there a sense of it being a very traditional household, even though it's all daughters? Was there a sense of a women's role as you were growing up of being constrained in terms of your expectations, your future? My parents were like, kind of wonderful about encouraging us to think what we wanted to think. My father was kind of a, a, a rabid Republican, and my mother was very definitely uh, in the communist world. And so... I had that, that sort of counterbalance. And even though my father was really kind of in charge of the household and expecting th something from my mother in terms of taking care of the kids and having dinner on the table and his, his clothes pressed and his tie in a certain place, um, my mother was very opinionated. 
and she always spoke up. And my father kind of tolerated that. And it was a beautiful thing. And they loved each other desperately their whole lives and uh, allowed their children to sort of follow the paths that they wanted. And if there was a- anything that, uh, that my, I might have wanted a little more of, it is guidelines. Uh, certainly when I was a teenager, they, they kind of let me run free. And so there were no expectations about marriage over career or career over marriage? I mean, it was very... There were, there were no expectations about a career or about marriage. I think they, they just impressed us with, with their connection to one another and their care for their children. And they, they kind of lived their life as as an example for all of us. I want to skip forward to Berkeley now. Do you all move? My father um, uh, left his insurance business and he came out to California and he started his own business in Southern California. And that's how we got to California. And uh, they really insisted that I choose one of the universities in California because they just couldn't afford to pay for me to go to a school back east. And uh, at that time, to go to the University of California, it cost $96 a semester, if you can imagine. What a beautiful public education system. And so Berkeley, for what reason? Well, I went to the University of California in Santa Barbara first. And uh, I had a group of friends, and we just decided... We didn't like it. We wanted a bigger place, and we moved to Berkeley in the fall of 1964. So we just kind of came front and center on the free speech movement, and it was a moment in time. Can you put us there? Well, I was um, sort of on the fringes of that. Uh, I just wrote a book about 40 years of Chez Panisse, and I reflected on that big demonstration that was going on many many big demonstrations and I I was kind of afraid to go into it so I was just on on the edge and absorbing uh, everything I think sort of osmosis that Mario Savio was saying and what people were thinking both about the war in Vietnam but more importantly um, really about this world that we could create, that we are uh, this idealistic place where people could uh, pick up friends and take them to the cities and not lock their doors and not lock their bikes and offer people food who didn't have enough. And uh, it was uh, a beautiful moment um, where we really imagined that we could live harmoniously together. You've talked about how you, on reflection, for you maybe some of what Mario Savio is saying is rooted in the way that he's brought up, the communal tables of southern France and northern Italy, that sort of passion which they live and share. Well, I think that was something very important uh, that Mario Savio communicated, was the way that he lived his life, the way he was brought up. And he was, uh, had an Italian sort of roots, and um, he, he had a bottle of wine on the table every night and brought his family and friends around. Uh, this was uh, a kind of an important um, ritual for him. A feminine mystique, Betty Friedan's book, comes out in 63. Had that registered with you at all? Well, it certainly registered with me, uh, uh, the feminine mystique. I mean, you, you, you couldn't uh, live in Berkeley without being really impressed by it. Uh, and I, uh, I, I absorbed all of that, too. And it probably it sort of helped me to have the confidence to open up a restaurant. Uh, I, I felt empowered in a way by that, by the 
women's movement that was uh, sort of erupting. And the, just the, the way that we were thinking about really living together, all of us, that we had to have some kind of balance and that, that women had to, to really be a big part of that picture. What was primary for you? Was it the free speech movement? Was it civil rights? Was it the war? Was there a sort of healthy ferment of all of them? When I think about all that was going on, the civil rights and the women's movement and the war um, in Vietnam, there's no question it was about the war in Vietnam for me. I, w I mean, yes, it was all of those things, but I, I was... Um, I was so shocked by what was happening uh, in our name. And uh, I read the, the white papers that Robert Shearer wrote back then. And that really, uh, that peace movement was um, what kind of brought me into, the, into politics. And what did bringing you into politics, what did that mean for you? Well, at first, it really meant that I was ready to go door to door and talk to people about uh, the war. And I uh, got involved with uh, Bob Shear's um, campaign for Congress, and I just went boldly down to uh, North Oakland and West Oakland, and I knocked on those doors, and I... I believed that we could get people to the polls, that they would hear Bob, and, and they'd be changed by the message he was delivering. And I was so disappointed when he lost. I mean, I just, I couldn't imagine that the truth that he was speaking was not compelling enough to the people, to everyone, that, that somehow he would be elected to Congress. And so I, I kind of dropped back. I opened Chirpenis. <laughs> I'm interested in three steps, actually, before that. The first is about communes and consciousness raising. Is this something that, this kind of search for a commune, search for groups of like-minded people, is that something that emerges in your life then? Well, I think I've always been searching for a group of people that that either I want to live with or li want to live close to. I, I, I love living in Berkeley because I share so many of the same values with so many friends and neighbors, people I don't even know. I feel a sense of that. Uh, and so it's very important to me. And I think I've been talking about, you know, an old folks commune, if you will, but it's never been with the idea of an old folks' home. It's always been a um, multi-generational, uh, integrated experience where, where people can uh, participate, even if they're young or they're old, and that we have meaningful work to do, and that we help each other. But I, I have a wonderful time. So that's been a piece of my thinking and probably certainly came from uh, just the experience that we were all having in the 60s and in the 70s. Two things, but the first is teaching and the second is France. And it seems those are both, you know, huge currents in they your are. life still today. You go to the UK and then you come back here and are teaching, but you also have these two very important trips around France. I guess it really began my, my thinking about education. Um, when I was an intern at the Montessori School here in Berkeley, and I, I, I had always struggled at sort of at the desk and trying to uh, do this kind of abstract thinking um, uh, around math or science. I, I, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't relate really. I did okay in all those subjects, but I, I loved my third grade teacher because she 
carved little birds out of driftwood and she got us to paint them and we went out in the woods and all of that that really is part of kind of an education of the senses that Maria Montessori uh, embraced as the kind of uh, philosophy behind uh, her whole pedagogy uh, of teaching and I, when I went to the Montessori school in Berkeley, I just felt like, ah, you know, this, this is it. I completely get it. I, this is, it, it's not only very idealistic in terms of the outcome of the sensory education. I mean, she imagined we'd all be friends on the planet, that that was, uh, it was the United Nations, and she had that big vision of the world and yet she began with each child and uh, learning how to taste learning how to see something learning how to touch and and listen and it was very very important to me at that stage did it feel like that could be a, a way of life for you I thought at one point that I could teach I discovered of course when I came back to teaching after I'd gone to France that that I didn't have the patience to do it. I, I was kind of wanting it to happen all at once. And, and some of the kids, uh, you know, were taking a long time to have this enlightenment. And uh, I, I just felt like I, I, I would leave that to people who, who wanted to move at a slower pace. And then... I went to France. I went to France in my junior year in college, not with the university, but on on my own with a friend. And uh, we had quite an edible education. We didn't go to class. And I'm not sure I learned French. I, I didn't learn French, really. I had lots of friends in France who spoke English. and But I absorbed a beautiful a beautiful, beautiful experience of the culture. Put me right at the beginning. I mean, how do you even get there? We made this uh, crazy reservation on Luxem- uh, what is it called? Luxembourg Airlines. And we flew from New York to Iceland and from Iceland to Luxembourg. And then we took a bus uh, to Paris in in the middle of the night and went through all of northern France uh, in the dark, uh, no lights on, even in the middle of little towns, uh, just maybe one or two little lights that were uh, that you could see. Um, but it was quite a revelation to arrive in Paris. And I was very lucky because I arrived in you know, 1965, and it was a time when, when the food from Paris came from right around Paris, and uh, there were two markets a day, one in the morning and one at night, and if you wanted fresh, delicious food, you had to go to the one in the morning and you had to go at night, and you had to buy your fre- bread every day right at that baker down the street, support the restaurants that were right around where we lived. And so I I didn't know. I I thought it was just about food. When I came back, I I fell in love with with the taste of, of the dishes I had. But it was really way more than that. I just fell in love with with the whole way of life that uh, that took food and connected it to nature the time the moment in time this is the moment for wild strawberries and this is the moment for you know persimmons and it was just that way everybody ate that way why did you even go there in the first place i mean what was you you and your friend was there some dream some movie you'd seen a book um well, I think my friend, uh, who was much more literate than I was, had read a lot of, a lot about France, a lot of um, literature from France. But 
I wanted to go because my mother had taught me how to count to 10 in French. <laughs> and I thought somehow I would be able to communicate in some way. And I knew little words and phrases uh, that, that I learned as a kid. And had you seen the, the films that we'll get to, the Pagnol films? Had you seen them by then, or was that part of the love affair? Seeing the films of Pagnol really didn't come until much later. Uh, that came at the end of the 60s uh, with my friendship with, with Tom Luddy and seeing those films at the theaters in San Francisco. But when I went, uh, I almost had a Pagnol experience being there. I mean, it was much more sophisticated than the, the kind of Provençal uh, world that Pagnol lived in. But it was that same set of values that you kind of met your friends in the cafe in the afternoon to have a, have a, have a coffee or a glass of wine. And, and you went to little restaurants because you knew people. You knew the people who ran them. You met your friends in the market. Uh, you went to a concert at night. Uh, it was just part of the experience. And the students had this great priority that we could have almost the best seats. And uh, going to the opera, I think, was free for students. We could sit up in the balcony. So I had a cultural kind of um, inspiration when I was there, as well as a, a, a gastronomic revelation. So is it there that it starts to dawn on you that food is going to be an increasingly important part of your life? Well, I know I knew right then, I mean, very quickly on, that it was um, more important than anything else I was supposed to be learning in France. <laughs> I mean, it just, it just was the priority. It's where are we going to eat? <laughs> you know, what little restaurant do we want to go to? And what were the foods that you... Everything from oysters. I, ne I had never eaten anything, really. I, I, I felt uh, just completely ignorant. And everything that I tasted, I loved. Food in California uh, back in the 60s, I mean, it was fancy French restaurants or just mediocre, uh, you know, very much fast food was emerging, uh, uh, just not tasty, very much out of a package. Uh, there were a few little restaurants that were kind of beginning to emerge in Berkeley, uh, but not very many. They were the, the good ones, at least after I had been to France, the good ones were really fancy French restaurants. But for you, so going to France, so oysters, mussels, rillettes, I mean, all these things were just... Every, every day it was something really, really special for me, and, and, and very simple. I mean, apricot jam, an oyster on the half shell. I mean, it wasn't a big preparation. It wasn't like, I mean, maybe a pâté was, but I didn't have the sense of that. It would just be served with a few pickles and a little salad on the side. And always the salad came after the main course and always a small amount of dessert. Uh, the portions were, were just right for me. I came back and sort of uh, was enthusiastic like Julia Child. She had that kind of revelation in Paris like I did out in the marketplace. But she came home and she just started, you know, chopping those onions, determined to learn how to master the art of French cooking. And I, I was just uh, learning how to cook almost as a necessity to eating well, you know, that I had to do it myself. I had to find these ingredients because they didn't exist, uh, you know, just out there in the supermarket. And so the films, talk about them. I mean, talk about the waterfront, isn't it? The uh, it's a waterfront in Marseille. It, 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 well, it, in and around and the hillsides beyond. But Peniel was 
was really talking about those those values of humanity, civilization. I mean, we're talking about taking care of the land and and uh, having meaningful relationships with your family and friends, enjoying the rituals of life, uh, uh, generosity and good humor and and taking care of your children and all of those um, all of those um, ways of living that give life meaning and that's it that's what he was talking about and he was saddened by the way France was changing that people were coming from the land abandoning the land and coming into the city and 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 then living kind of crazy lives and and you know and then this little family of people that he worked with i mean they really were his his friends and they were in all of his films and you got to know them the baker and the baker's wife and the priest and the, they were all the same actors that were in his films and he you know he he just got me to to pay attention to that that way of living life and I of course um, I'm in the rapids, but um, you have to take your time. And who was Panisse? Panisse was the character in the Paniol trilogy. Uh, uh, he was the only one who, who made any money, and he offered to marry Fanny when her boyfriend left for the sea, and he left her pregnant. And to save her honor... He offered to marry her. And it's a beautiful thing. Is he in some sense the Paniol figure, the kind of nostalgic in some ways? Uh, well, he was uh, a little outrageous and a little preposterous and, uh, you know, all of that. He was, he was boastful and uh, liking young pretty women and all of that. But he had kind of a heart of gold. And in a sense, that is a Paniol figure. How does the restaurant emerge? So I came back and I taught school again and discovered uh, that I liked cooking for my friends at home more than I liked teaching. And I just thought, well, you know, if I opened up a little restaurant, they could come there and then they could pay and I could make a good living and I could see them. But, of course, it didn't work that way. I opened a little restaurant but it took all of my time, and I couldn't see my friends. So that was, um, and I didn't make any money for a long time. <laughs> so I guess, uh, but we had a great time. But it sounds like the first few years were tough. I mean, I don't know how emotionally difficult they were. Maybe you were just living it, but probably looking back, you're thinking, God, how did I get through that? Well, I do think uh, about those first years as being... Uh, Pretty crazy and and very intense. Uh, I, but I I just did it because because I had a passion to sort of make this thing right and to make it work and to get people to like what we were cooking for them. I I just I, I was just intent on it, and because of that, I I just never worried if I got paid or I had enough sleep or or if I was living any kind of normal life. It just, nothing else mattered except finding food that these people in the dining room would love. And that was it. Did you know beforehand that you had that in you? I read one time in a yearbook that my teacher wrote uh, that I was determined and driving and you know, uncompromising. And I, I was surprised by what he, he said to me, and uh, it just sort of uh, um, was a beautiful memory. I liked that because he thought I would have a wonderful t time in my life too, which I have had. And so uh, in reflection, I, I guess 
And my family has always said to me that I, I was impossibly stubborn. So no question of quitting? There was no question of quitting, ever. I never, no, no. There was no question of quitting. Do you remember, for example, opening night in this building? Can you put us there on that, how you felt? I was in the dining room, and I was really excited, and I was just trying to get everything right. And, um, you know, I, it was all the last-minute things. I, I wanted a rug on the staircase, and I do remember vis- vividly that people were coming in the door, and I was still putting the rug up the stairs. Uh, and it's, it, it was just kind of a rush of... of lots of things coming together and um, it's hard to it's kind of in a blur but but they all came back the next day so <laughs> maybe it's because they didn't get fed <laughs> I mean the community had been a big sense of what you were about and bringing friends together but what about the tighter community with family was there a sense of what were you I'm not sure if you were married at that point or if Fanny was around at that point no, I, I didn't have uh, a family at that time. I never even thought about having a child. I, I, uh, it was even difficult to have a relationship with, with, with someone uh, because I was pretty much married to the restaurant. I mean, I was there from early in the morning to late at night, and, and uh, all the people who worked in the restaurant uh, sort of socialized together. Uh, we, you know... We never had time off for the first years. And, and I thought about that, how to make that a kind of civilized time that I remembered witnessing in France when I, when I was going into restaurants early. I would see them all sitting at a table and having lunch together or, or uh, that sort of scene happening late at night. And... and restaurateurs at the marketplace and buying their food and having their their all the people who worked in the restaurant carrying the bags and I I, I think that was sort of again part of, of just absorbing these experiences and and really uh, they became part of me I never um, sort of learned them they just I just absorbed this kind of life and uh, wanted it. So how did you make room for more of a work-life balance? What I've done, though, is I, I don't see... It's, again, a Montessori idea. I don't see work and pleasure. I mean, life outside. I, I think they have to go together, that you have to have pleasure in your work and, and work in your pleasure. They, they, they're, they're like this and there are little higher times or lower times but basically you're trying to find a balance in that way rather than this and that and just sort of trying to bring that together what point did you realize it, it was going to be okay the business was going to that it was a business I guess and that it was going to work out I guess I really uh, accounted on my friends who were in business and one particular friend in Berkeley had a cooking store and she came and she helped us and when she came into the office and picked up all the little pieces of paper and tried to make sense of the numbers I knew we would be okay somehow we would be okay I, but I never thought we wouldn't be if we just served the best food we would be okay it was just getting to that that um, there was a challenge. The restaurant becomes a broad network as well, doesn't it? Farmers and the other suppliers. How did that emerge? It's really um, kind of incredible how we built this network of suppliers because I was never really looking for local sustainable food. I I, I wasn't looking for that at the beginning. We were looking for taste. We were looking for the food that tasted like what I had eaten in France. So I wanted the little strawberries. 
I thought they were just little big strawberries and and the little Arico Vert, the skinny little French ones, I thought they were small Kentucky Wonder Beans. And so I sorted the boxes and I tried to do it that way. And then um, I realized that, that, you know, I needed to bring the seeds from France and, and I, I, I wanted to have those planted so that we could have the salad, the mescaline salad that I had had in the south of France. And then, um, you know, we started foraging out there just wherever we went. We went to Chinatown to try to find ducks that were, you know, not in packages. And, and uh, we went to farm stands at the beginning drove down to Palo Alto and out in the Central Valley and would get the corn and bring back boxes and cars. And, uh, and then we had this idea that, that maybe if we planted a garden in a, in a really good place uh, that uh, we hired a farmer and we could make this happen for the restaurant. But of course, you have to know a lot about the land, to choose the right place, to put the right varietals in, and it wasn't easy like that to do. And we had someone working in the restaurant, really incredible, who had made friends, had many friends who were farmers, and was very interested in the farmer's market movement, and was the cook at the restaurant. And she said, maybe I should go out and try and find people who would like to grow for the restaurant. And that's what she did. She brought us the first um, lettuces and, and sort of cool weather crops from Warren Weber, who was out in Bolinas. And then she brought us uh, produce from the Central Valley. And we began to make friends in that way with the farmers. And we'd invite them to dinner, and she would write about them so that the staff could know who they were. And, and uh, there were times that we would go down to a trout stream and uh, Big Sur and pick up the live trout. And there were many, many experiences of, of searching for ingredients uh, at the restaurant before we really built this wonderful network. And then ultimately it was it was really my father who helped us to find a farmer a full-time uh, uh, farmer that could grow what we wanted I mean the bulk of what we wanted uh, and where we could work together and sort of take our compost to his farm and bring back the vegetables and and uh, uh, now we have Bob Kennard up in Sonoma, and that's what he does. He, he um, grows for Chez Panisse, and we, we think he's extraordinary. And he's, he's not just farming for us, but he is uh, teaching in the most beautiful way. He has interns from all around the world who come and work for him. And he inspires us all to think about the land in a, in a very different way. And um, it's something that I never wanted to talk about. I always uh, wanted health to be the outcome of living well. And so I never wanted to talk about it. But Bob, our farmer, really likes to talk about it because he really believes that his fruits and vegetables are more nutritious because they are absorbing the rich soil at his farm that he builds uh, in harmony with all of the little bugs and, and beasts uh, that live up there on the farm. He's working with nature uh, in this beautiful way. And he... He has really made an impression on me, and um, so I'm. Whereas I resisted my mother's nutrition, uh, this uh, delicious edible education uh, 
has has made me believe that we can uh, bring children into a new relationship to food. And I guess that's really the experience of having my own child and watching her fall in love that made me believe that we could do this in the public schools. When I think of California, in the time that you've been living here, I presume it's tragic. Is it sort of finger in the dike as California has changed? In my time here in California, things have changed entirely in really unfortunate ways and in very fortunate ways. Really, there's like, it's, it's the good news and the bad news. The orange groves have disappeared, but a whole new generation of young people is planting the, uh, the orange groves again. Unless you're really involved with the farmers of the state, that you don't know what's really going on. There, there, it's, it's, um, it's been an education for me, uh, but I started a long time ago. I mean, I started 30 years ago, or more than 30 years ago, really. Uh, 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 but, and it has been that relationship that I have with the producer that makes me a, a sort of treasure their work because I could never do that. And so when I go to the farmer's market, I think about it as making a contribution to the environment when I go there. I, whatever I give them, whatever price I give them, I'm thinking that now I can help send their kids to college. I want them to feel empowered by the buying that happens there, by the, 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 not just the money exchanging, but by the support of, uh, of the people who are so enthusiastic about what, uh, what, they're, what they're selling, all their beautiful produce. It's incredible. Why so few women, top women chefs, top women restaurateurs? I think it really is changing. There are many, many women that are in the restaurant business, but I've thought about that, uh, you know, all my life. And it, it really has to do uh, with children, it really has to do with children. That if you have a family, you're working at hours that are just completely contrary to what would make a family life. I mean, you need to be present at the dinner table. And you're always working when people are not working. So it's been a really mission of Chez Panisse to figure out a different kind of system that allows people to have a civilized life. And I think it's, it, it's kind of unique, uh, at least I don't know where in any places, that have two chefs who work uh, each three days a week and they're paid for five. And in their, their two days off, uh, they're in contact, but they really can be with their family and they can be with their friends. And we have two chefs who work the downstairs in the restaurant. They each work six months. They work five days but they have six months off and they can write a book or they can teach a class or they can have a life with their family and friends. And I think it's so important that there's flexibility in terms of, uh, of even the, all the other cooks in the restaurant that they can work nights, they can work days, they can work in the dining room, they can work in the kitchen. So that you're, you're really um, I, I'm always thinking about, uh, you know, having uh, that connection with nature, even if you're inside and you're in restaurants. So we have a table outside where people, the staff can eat. And uh, the, there are no doors to the kitchen because I wanted to watch the sunset <laughs> from the kitchen. 
I also wanted to talk to the customers and get them to eat their food. But uh, that was the reason we did that. I, I, if you're going to be in the restaurant for you know, 15 hours a day, it should be nourishing in that way, in that Montessori way, that it should appeal to the senses. We should be able to have flowers in the kitchen. We should be able to have art on the walls. We should be able to have uh, a connection with each other around the table. And, and that's, that's really been important to me. But the Edible Schoolyard, how did that start? I guess the ideas for the Edible Schoolyard or edible education were really, you know, planted back there uh, by Maria Montessori. Because I, I understood how important education is for everyone. I mean, she was talking about for everyone, not just for people that can afford it, but for everyone. And when the 25th birthday arrived, or in and around there, a little bit before the 25th birthday, uh, I was again uh, uh, talking about uh, the decline of public education in Berkeley, and the principal of the school that I was talking about called me on the phone, he said, come over and, and take a look at the school, and maybe you can help beautify it. So I did. I went there. And I did. But uh, from the moment he asked for help, I never thought about planting flowers or even vegetables on the front of the school. I always thought, ah, at last, we can take over the school lunch and we can make a beautiful lunchroom. And then, then I thought, well, you know, we need a garden. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all connected. We build a garden. We need a, a place to teach kids about cooking, and then we need a place where they can eat that food. And so it was all together. And I proposed that to him, and he said he'd like to think about it for a little while. <laughs> and six months later, I thought he'd forgotten. Six months later, he called me up, and he said, I think we're ready now. And he said, just don't talk about that part about all kids eating for free, because I think it might frighten people. Let's just start with a garden. And you and I will know that it's about, really about integrating a cafeteria into the academic curriculum. But we won't talk about that right now. We're just going to talk about the garden. I said, okay. We could do that, and we had a lot of brainstorming sessions with lots of gardeners and teachers, and we created a, what he called a revolutionary committee, uh, and we invited, again, we, we used that feeding people ideas idea, invited the teachers over to Chez Panisse to have their math meetings, and, and talked about you know, whatever they wanted to talk about. But at the same time, we were delivering this edible education message. And it grew from there. It really, uh, the garden uh, wasn't planted for a couple of years because we, we were busy sort of planting ideas in people's minds. And, and we wanted the whole school to, to be engaged in this way because... We're not really teaching gardening, per se, out in the garden. We're, it's a math class that's coming out, and it just happens to be in the garden. And the kids are doing the work of measuring the beds. Or they're, and while they're doing that, they're picking the raspberries. And they're out in the sun, and they're experiencing another dimension of, of being in school. And they like it. They really, really like it. And that's the key, is that they really like it. Because if they really like it, then these are habits uh, that they're going to have for their whole life. And it was like I felt when I went to France. I loved it. And I wanted to eat like that. 
um, I wanted to live like that. And that's what's going to bring children into a, you know, a beautiful world of nature and culture at the table and, and just uh, finding themselves. Being able to, to make decisions about, about their own health. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. A piece of advice that you'd give a young woman, whether it's on building a career or on work-life balance? I don't believe in sort of building a career. I don't think like that. I, I, I think, you know, you're, you're talking about the way you want to live your life. And it can't be that... I think of career as being about making money and... and going up in the ladder and, and, and being successful in some way that, that people expect you to be successful. And who knows, you might just like sweeping floors. I like sweeping floors. You know, I like making my bed. I like doing that. I like washing dishes. I like washing salad. Uh, and you're looking for that thing that, that, that you're passionate about. And I think defining it in this way and thinking of, you know, obviously it's not about money. You need enough to nourish yourself and your family and your friends and have that. But that's, that's um, delusional. The most meaningful piece of advice you've ever received. Take your time. Take your time. What did you want to be when you grew up? I mean, we know what you're doing now. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I, I just assumed that I would uh, follow the path of my older sister. And she got married when she was in college, and, and she had two children, and um, her husband worked in a newspaper, and, and they, they, they made a, a, a wonderful life together. And I just assumed that I would have children and that would, that would be my life. Uh, so it, it, it's, it was a quite uh, a, a surprise to my family that I wanted to open a restaurant. But it was my father who gave me, who mortgaged his house to give me the money to open the restaurant. So he, he uh, you know, had a a kind of adventurous spirit and I think his whole life he was in that treadmill place of a job and he never really understood what what he wanted until it was almost too late until he was at the end of his 50s that he had meaningful work and he was always pushed um, to do things in a certain way. He was incredible. I mean, when we opened the cafe, the restaurant just quickly doubled, tripled in size over a period of a year. And, and everything that I had been kind of communicating one-on-one was impossible. And so uh, he wanted to have meetings. To, he, he was a business psychologist, and he wanted me to have meetings with everybody to discuss this. <laughs> And I just couldn't be at a meeting like that. I, it just felt like uh, some tea group from the 50s and 60s. And I just, I, I didn't want to communicate like that. And he came down in the middle of the night and talked with the dishwashers. And he, um, he made me get a computer. <laughs> He did, and he, uh, he, he just worked with the whole staff, and he wrote a book called um, Organic Management at the End of His Life, and reflecting the last, that the last uh, chapter was about Chez Panisse and how unorthodox it was, and how, how it should never have succeeded, but how it did. And uh, it gave me a kind of credibility in the business world um, 
and I got a business leadership award along with uh, the Hyatt Hotels and I think Domino's Pizza. <laughs> and I wondered why I got this business leadership award and, and uh, the person who, in, uh, who invited me said, it's because of this green that's on the plate. I thought, the green, they, you mean the parsley? At the sal-? He said, yes, you helped us put salad on the plate. That's, that's why you're getting this. And you've been successful at that. <laughs> and I thought, I've, it just, and I, I do think I've, I've brought salad into the world. Certainly in the world of Chez Panisse, there, there's not a single plate that doesn't have a salad on it. The accomplishment you're most proud of? My daughter, without any question. Your first paying job? My first paying job. I was a car hop. <laughs> I was a car hop in uh, Michigan City, Indiana, at the Country Cousin. Three adjectives that describe you? Determined, uncompromising, and I guess passionate. And the person you've never met with the biggest influence on your life? It's really hard to say because I, have, I am constantly impressed by, by people who are doing work that I could never do. And uh, I have had people like that all along from Maria Montessori all the way to Peter Sellers. And there are many, many, many others in between uh, certainly, uh, you know, in terms of cooking, uh, Elizabeth David uh, uh, opened my mind. But there are so many people that I treasure, and and I I allow them to to change my thinking, and I try to change theirs. And it goes without saying that Peniel, Marcel Peniel, has probably had the greatest influence on my life. Lightning round. iPad or notepad? iPad or notepad? How about iPhone? <laughs> and iPad. I have I, I, I Again, it's a very uh, tactile thing for me. I never could use a computer. Never, ever, ever. And then I could touch and I could make this thing happen for me. Uh, and... That's, uh, that's where I am, addicted. Early bird or night owl? Uh, absolutely early bird. I, I, I can't stay up late. Spontaneous or methodical? I mean, people think I'm spontaneous, but I'm, I'm very plotting and planning in that way. I like things in order. Um, I like to have that order in the world around me. Diplomatic or direct? I think I'm diplomatically direct. <laughs> Taipei? Taipei or easygoing? No question. Taipei. Higher math score or higher verbal score? Oh, well, I- I'm not sure I had either high math or high verbal, <laughs> but I think of myself uh, as as absolutely uh, uh, in a world of books, more, more literal. Patient or impatient? Impatient. Prada or Gap? Prada or Gap? You mean expensive or inexpensive? Uh, dosa. <laughs> prepare or cram? I prepare in a very unusual way. Uh, but I definitely cram at the end. Domestically skilled or domestically challenged? Domestically enlightened, I think. (laughs) 10 minutes early or 10 minutes late? Always uh, early. Book smart or street smart? I'm not brave out there on the streets. I'm not, I don't think of myself as street smart. I am uh, aware, sensually aware of the world around me. I'm very, very conscious of smells. I'm looking. I'm hearing. 
sounds I'm very open in that way and if that connects to street smart then that's what I am